morning. It's great to see you today. I'm looking forward to that cooler fall weather, aren't y'all? Yeah, I can't wait for it to come. How do we live life on purpose? Where is it that we can empower, engage, and incarnate the love of God to the world? These are the questions that we have been asking over uh, the past two weeks, and then we'll conclude today about how we live life on purpose. If you'll open up your worship guide and look at the graphic that's there, you'll find what is represented is three concentric circles, and each circle represents a sphere of influence in which we are serving God and serving one another. In the outer ring that says empower, there are two degrees of separation between ourselves and the person that is receiving the direct ministry where we incarnate God's love. In that sphere, we can help those people that are helping other people. Every time we take up a communion rail offering or an offering to help children and youth go on a mission trip where we're supplying money and food to KCM, uh, we find ourselves in that outer circle with two degrees of separation. And then as we move uh, closer to the center, that second concentric circle is the place where we actually engage other people. That is where we are the people who are helping other people. And every time we are volunteering somewhere, either at our favorite organization or at some helping um, organization or in a hospital or school, there we are impacting the people that are right in front of us and we're making a difference in their life. But today we're gonna talk about that inner circle where there is zero degrees of separation between ourselves and those in whom we live life together. This is the smallest circle, and it's also the most difficult circle for us to live in because we are living life in the same places with those people in that circle. We are living life in such a way that there is a deep intimacy and sharing between one another. And we can't have many people in this circle. It is only those who are closest to us that we discover how we can serve there. This morning, our scripture lesson uh, comes from Paul's letter to the Roman church. I'll be reading from the 12th chapter, beginning at verses 9 through 12. Will you bow your heads as we pray for illumination? Gracious God, your word became flesh in your son, Jesus. And so may these words of scripture become incarnate in our lives. Open our hearts and our minds to discern within them the very word of God. May your Holy Spirit inspire us to deep listening For this we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Paul writes, Love should be shown without pretending. Hate evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like the members of your family. Be the best at showing honor to each other. Don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope. Stand your ground when you're in trouble and devote yourselves to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome strangers into your home. Bless people who harass you. Bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal, and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. 
Don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. Don't try to get revenge for yourselves, dear friends, but leave room for the wrath of God. It is written in the scriptures, Revenge belongs to me. I will pay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Do not be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. The words of Scripture for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Christina Fox wrote in an article which is entitled, Don't Go It Alone, You Were Made for Community. She tells a story about she went to visit her relatives one summer who happened to live in Alaska. After she had been there a couple of days and adjusted to things, she suggested to her cousin, maybe we should go hiking. Where's a good place to go hiking? And then she added, without any bears. And her cousin just kind of chuckled and she said, oh, there are a lot of great places to go hiking, but I don't think there are any places without bears. But it's going to be okay, because as long as we're hiking together, we're going to be safe. And Ms. Fox went on to write that there was a time in our society when we lived with our families, either under one roof or we lived close by, so that we were supported by our families. And then today, we live farther away from one another. We live in this kind of disconnection, which even affects the church, that these relationships that we have most often are the relationships that we have at work, and yet they tend to be superficial, shallow and fickle. She said, even within the church, we see this kind of separateness. In the church, we see individualism and disconnectedness. She went on to say, there are some people that serially date churches. They go from one place to another to another but never landing anywhere. And she said, there are also some people who stake a claim in a church. They'll attend in that place until something better attracts them, and they won't be there. And finally, she said, there are also those who have made a commitment to the church, but they're not all in and they're not fully known by their community. They're there, but they don't rely on the church to be that place which will lift them up when they are down, when they will comfort them when they mourn, where they will cry when they cry, and they will laugh when they're happy. You see, it takes a pretty special place, even within the church itself, to find that kind of community. And so many people, I believe, that go to churches, of course, not this one, you understand, who simply pretend that they're doing okay when they're not, who think that they can go it alone when they shouldn't. You see, God created us for community with one another. 
In the second creation story in the book of Genesis, we find that God scoops up some of the earth, the clay of the earth, and he forms a little man into shape, the Adam, and he blows into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a companion with God. But God soon realized something about the man. He said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And so he took a rib out of the man's side, and from that he fashioned woman. And the two were joined together and became one flesh. You see, we were created for community, and the very first community that we live in is the community of our families. It is the closest relationship that we have. And whether that family is our family of origin, or whether it is the by, but rather whether it is the community that we choose or they choose us, that is where we live life on purpose in a close and intimate way. I want to show you a video. It stars uh, Michael and Laura Griffin. You saw uh, that one of the couples in that video was them. And they're going to be talking about what it means for them to live life in community. You're all in the same boat together, and so once uh, once you all get together, you start eating, you start going through the um, whichever book or program you're going through. It just it makes it just it makes it simple and it make and it makes it fun. Um, if you always you could always make excuses not to go, and so that was the part of kind of forced you into a situation to have to get together with other people, which ends up being great. My question would be. How important is it for you to be connected to your community? Because it was, I thought it was important to me to get out and make friends. And yet, we moved here and we lived here for three years before. And I made friends in that point. And we made couple friends in that first three years. But I think I honestly kept thinking something would just magically happen and fall into my lap. And I kept complaining like, oh, I wish we knew people better. I wish we had more people. And so that would be my question. How bad do you want community? Because if you want it bad enough, you just have to make it a priority. It will never, ever, ever be convenient, ever. It will not be convenient for you and the other families. It was miraculous that we would even find a night for all of us to meet right. and it wasn't perfect sometimes you know the husband was a little bit late because of work or sometimes the mom and one kid were a little bit late because of soccer practice but that's the thing if it's important to you you just have to make it a priority even though it will like he said it will never be convenient so did you hear the question that she asked how important is it for you to live in community? And are you willing to make it a priority in your lives because it isn't simply going to happen on its own? In this Roman passage that was read earlier, we find uh, the gold standard of Christian behavior of Christian character through which we become made into the image of Christ. We become mature Christians by practicing these behaviors. Paul prefaced these words in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. 
We can only do that when we are living life together. The apostle put it this way from the message. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Be good friends who love deeply. Run for dear life from evil and hold on to dear life to the good. Practice playing the second fiddle. Don't quit in hard times, but pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. I'm pretty good at that one. I don't know about y'all. Laugh with your friends who are happy when they're happy. Share tears with your friends when they are down. Get along with each other. Discover the beauty in everyone. You see, these are the benchmarks that point to personal transformation that help us to know that we are growing into the image of Christ in which God has created us to be. And in that community that we do that, there is zero degrees of separation. I think that community is the best place that we can grow into Christ-like character. And, the, and most often that takes place with our families. I've always said, if I can learn to be Christian in my family, I can be Christian anywhere. And you know what I'm talking about. We assume that our families love us, and so we show them the worst of ourselves, don't we? After all, they aren't going to leave us. they got to love us and accept us. But I don't think they've got to put up with bad behavior. Instead, they are to help us to mature, not only physically and emotionally, but especially spiritually. And that is what Jesus did with his own disciples. There was zero degrees of separation between God the Father and God the Son, who is Jesus. Jesus, in one place in the scripture, said, The Father and I are one. And in that relationship, Jesus learned how to pour himself into the lives of 12 followers who would later become disciples and then apostles of the church. He poured his life into them to the point of death and then was raised from the dead and sent them into the world to love as he has loved, to share that incarnate love with others. Personal transformation happens within the life of a community, a family, or of friends, or those with whom we have the deepest of relationships. Some of you may know Reverend Hannah Terry. Hannah was a graduate of Duke University in 2012. She was appointed to Westbury United Methodist Church. She was a very bright young woman, and when she arrived, she was given uh, the rather daunting task of going and beginning a ministry in the apartment complexes along Fondren Road. Now, you may remember that after the oil bust in 2008, those upper end apartment complexes, people began to leave them in droves and what replaced them were people of a lower economic status. It became a town of refugees from Central um, America and Africa. And so she went into this community hoping to make a toehold for her own ministry. And at first, 
uh, she just tried to gather together people who were not like her. Some of them did not speak English. And together she was forming a small group. It was one person at first, and then two, and then four, and then it grew to be a group of about 12. She said, we ate together potluck meals, must have been Methodist. We shared prayer with one another, and I tried to listen deeply to what was their needs. Sometime later, she decided to move into the apartment complex that was next door to where she had started this ministry. And what we would call that was that she embedded herself within the community in which she was serving. She was living the life with those with whom she was serving. She was incarnating the love of God to people who felt disconnected from their past and for their families. And she was trying to build a community between these apartment complexes. And it didn't arise overnight. It took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears for her to form these small community groups. And that is what I think it means to love the neighbor where you are like Jesus loves, to live in a circle of zero degrees of separation. And you can't, you can't live with that kind of intimacy with too many people. It's really impossible. It may be your family. It may be a family that you have chosen or they have chosen you. But you're there for one another. I have a few friends that I've known for over 40 years and we've maintained our friendship. Some of you, uh, you have that as well. Some of those relationships began in seminary. Most of them are colleagues in ministry, and we ran together in the same circles. But it wasn't long before uh, I began to differentiate between those that were acquaintances or colleagues and those who were living in that inner circle of zero degrees of separation. They became a family to me. And there's really only about eight of them. And over the years, we have been there through the trials and tribulations, during good times and bad. We have laughed together a lot. And we have cried. And in that community, we discovered for one another the support, the love, the companionship, that helps us to grow in our love for each other and for the world. There aren't very many people that we can do that. But they are the kinds of friends that even if we've not been together for a while, when we do get together, we pick up exactly where we had left off. Do you have friends like that? I'm sure you do those who are close to you, who support you, whom you love and they love you. They know when to comfort you and when to kick you in the pants to get you out of your pity party. They are that closest circle of friends in which we live life on purpose. So let me ask you this. How badly do you want that kind of community? How badly would you desire to be in a relationship that is so close that you begin to experience and incarnate the love of God into all the world? We have some groups like that in this church, community groups, Sunday school classes, choirs. 
We have people that go on mission trips together, and within those circles, some develop really strong relationships. And they love each other, and they watch out for each other, and they care for each other. Because, friends, we can't do life alone. We are made for community. So in life, in times of trial and tragedy, in times of death and celebration, we find that we aren't alone. God is with us, as well as the church. Thanks be to God. Amen.